Welcome back everyone to part two of my Lost Retrospective. I know it's been a while, but that's just because I'm lazy. This time we're doing something a bit different. As you can see, there's no visual element to this. That's because this video will be somewhere between a fully scripted analysis, like the first part, and a podcast. This is for two reasons. First of all, this video is really long and collecting all the clips for this kind of thing where the visuals aren't even that important in illustrating the points I'm trying to make, takes way too much time and doesn't really seem worth the effort. I assume most of you just tab out anyway. And secondly, it's convenient for both you and me because it means I can release the video a lot sooner. So hopefully you'll enjoy it nonetheless. So anyway, let's get into it. In part one, we left off at the end of season three where the writers took a big risk in order to revitalize the show, ending on a cliffhanger that revealed to us that some of our characters, at some point in the future, will escape the island. But here again, Lost finds the perfect way to bait and switch the audience. Yes, they get off the island, but it's only six of them, and they're not happy about it. They want to go back, or at least some of them do. So a seemingly clear and happy resolution we've been hoping for this entire time, our characters finally getting off the island, instead raises more questions and develops more intrigue to feed the narrative. Once again, we're hooked. The writers have successfully breathed new life into the show without jumping the shark. It's the perfect response to viewers who felt dissatisfied with the amount of progress being made in previous seasons. They just decided to jump ahead to the end goal of the entire show and say, actually, that's not the end of it at all. And that's the line that Lost had to toe throughout its entire run, balancing these plot twists and cliffhangers so as to keep the story fresh and consistently exciting, but without going too far and completely losing the audience, which some may argue the show did do eventually. But let's talk about season four because following the extremely uneven season three, if there's one season to prove that Lost didn't go downhill in this uniform, linear fashion a lot of people seem to think it did, it's season four. After reaching what I would consider to be the peak of its character-driven drama back in season one, in my opinion, season four sees the show reaching its plot-driven peak. Not to say that there aren't great character moments in season four, just the opposite, in fact. I think that season four is where the show finally managed to find the right balance, incorporating the character arcs confidently into the plot developments, unlike the sometimes messy balancing of plot and character that we found in season three. I feel like the distinction between plot versus character is something I will keep coming back to in this retrospective, and that's because it's basically the core of both the praise and criticism that the show receives. Having the story be mainly character-driven with the plot lurking in the background worked really well for the first season because we were being introduced to these characters and most of the entertainment came from watching them react to these situations they were thrown into. But as you progress in the story, you have to start progressing the plot, or else the audience will just feel like you're stalling. And this is where all the problems start emerging. How do you find that balance? How do you progress the plot appropriately while also allotting enough time to continue to develop your existing characters and also introduce new ones? And this is where season four shines. One of the main reasons presumably being that the writers now knew where they were headed. At this point, Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse had finally negotiated an endpoint for the series. Three more seasons, and that would be it. This allowed them to plan things out with a confidence that was missing in previous seasons. Knowing where the story is going allows you to keep moving the story forward at a steady pace, instead of stalling for eight episodes, then backloading all of the good bits right at the end. And that's why season four feels so different and refreshing. Every episode advances the plot, there's no filler, there's no stalling, it's constantly moving forward. And the flash-forward gimmick is a brilliant new narrative well for the writers to draw from. No longer do they have to come up with completely irrelevant flashbacks to fill the time. Now all they need to do is ask themselves, okay, if this character returned to the normal world, what would they do? And most of the flash-forwards just follow naturally from that question. For example, Kate is a criminal, so back in the real world, she's put on trial. Makes sense. 
and thematically speaking, the secondary purpose of these flash-forwards is to give our characters time to reflect on their experiences on the island, and allow them to compare an existence on the island to an existence back in the normal world, bringing to light the ways in which they've changed, and perhaps the things they think they're still missing. And of course the writers know that by the end of the season, they need to get all these characters to a point where they're willing to go back to the island. So there's really no time to waste in terms of narrative construction. We know exactly where we're headed, and when we need to get there, which is another factor that makes this season that much tighter. The flash-forward formula also switches up the order of thematic causality in relation to the events taking place on the island, and let me explain what I mean by that. See, what made the flashbacks so good in their prime was the ability the show had to parallel the struggle a character was going through in the flashback with the events taking place on the island. If you're going to have a show where every episode features one of the main character's flashbacks, that's obviously what you're going to do with them have that character resolve an internal struggle that's presented in the flashback on the island. It makes sense. And this formula was, especially in season one, really effective. But now that we're dealing with flash forwards, things are different. It's the opposite. The thematic struggle that a character is experiencing in the flash forwards is informed by what's happening, which is to say what happened, to that character on the island. This might seem pretty obvious, the past influences the present, that's just how time works, but after three seasons of seeing characters being confronted with their past while on the island, it's really refreshing to have that dynamic reversed. Now we have characters in the real world dealing with issues that arose on the magical island. It's just a welcome change of pace, and another one of the small ways this season manages to change things up and effectively give off the feeling of a new beginning for the show. But okay, now let's talk about some of these character arcs. Jin and Sun essentially complete their arc together in episode 7 when Juliet reveals Sun's affair to Jin and they're able to actually move past it. All of their episodes have been about the troubles within their relationship and their inability to be honest with each other and properly communicate their emotions, and now that the worst has come out and the relationship still stands despite everything, they're basically done. They do pull off a pretty good twist in this episode's flash-forwards, though. In the flash-forward scenes, we have these two parallel plotlines building up, one where Sun is going into labour, and the other one where Jin is running around trying to buy a toy panda for the baby and rushing to the hospital. But at the end of the episode, just after we get the big emotional scene on the island of Jin telling Sun that he'll never leave her, we realise that Jin's flash-forwards weren't actually flash-forwards. They were flashbacks, and he wasn't buying a panda for Sun, but for the grandchild of a business associate of Jin's boss. So he was just there to deliver a gift on behalf of Sun's dad. In some ways, this is a typical Blindelof bait and switch where throughout the entire episode you have these scenes, the context of which you don't really understand, or you think you understand but you're actually wrong about, and then at the end you get the big twist and you're just like, what? Was that really necessary? Is there any point to this twist other than just being a gotcha moment for the audience? It just feels kind of pointless and cheap. But there is some emotional weight to this bait and switch beyond just the superficial twist element, because it implies that Jin won't get off the island with Sun, and that he might die at some point in this season, but we don't know when or how or even if he truly is dead, which adds some suspense to later scenes in the finale when Jin's life is in danger and we expect him to die. But pulling them apart right at the moment their relationship is at its strongest is a good way of making us care about the future of their story and where it might be headed, instead of just coming up with new drama to inject into their relationship, because most of that has realistically been resolved already. Their story is no longer about resolving the issues that make them feel so distant from one another despite them being physically together, it's now the opposite, it's now about overcoming external forces that are keeping them physically apart, despite them now being emotionally together, if that makes sense. Most of the flash-forwards do a good job of moving us past the arcs that our characters have been going through for three seasons now, most of which have become somewhat repetitive. Whether it's Jin and Sun's relationship entering a new phase, 
or Kate's trial, which ends with her being sentenced to stay in one state. And the fact that she's okay with this is a big step forward, considering the fact that her arc was always about her innate desire to run away from her problems instead of actually confronting them head on. Ben's flash forward, which comes in a pivotal episode of the season, is also pretty solid. This episode features one of the best Ben moments in the entire show, as the mercenaries from the boat who have come to the island to capture Ben have killed Carl and Danielle, and are holding Alex, his adopted daughter, as a hostage. This builds to a really powerful moment where we see Ben do the same thing he's always done, try to talk his way out of it. That's always been his thing. No matter what the situation he gets himself into, he always talks his way out of it. He's a master of manipulation who always has another trick up his sleeve. But this time, it doesn't work. For the first time, he fails, and he loses one of the only people he genuinely cares about. And it all comes crashing down. This character, who for most of his life has felt invincible, using others as pawns and always getting away with it, has now suffered perhaps his first real loss. And this is where everything changes. Ben even says, he changed the rules. He feels like this was not supposed to happen. For perhaps the first time in the entire show, we actually feel sorry for Ben. And so when he does some weird shit with this pyroglyph thingy and calls the smoke monster to take out the goons, you're like, yeah, you fucking go, Ben. And the flash forward of that episode shows Ben on a quest for revenge, dealing with his grief. He manages to track down Whitmore, who sent the mercenaries, and he confronts him. But unfortunately, he threatens to kill uh, Penny, uh, which, of course, we as a viewer can't really be on board with because Penny is Desmond's girlfriend and we want them to end up together. So, you know, we're rooting for him, but he's still an evil piece of shit. And they have a little conversation where they mention the rules, and I like this dynamic between Ben and Whitmore quite a bit, because we understand that there's some kind of meta game going on that we're not really privy to, which isn't a specific new mystery that the show's pointing to, but it adds some intrigue and implies another level of the story that is yet to be discovered. These are characters who actually have some power and agency in all of this, as opposed to the protagonists we've been following this whole time who have no clue what's going on. A few of the flash-forwards are somewhat thematically redundant, though. For example, Saeed's story basically plays on the same ideas all of his flashbacks and storylines do. Themes of morality intertwined with love and whether or not he's actually a good man, blah blah blah. And Jack's flash-forward is another one I'm not too sure about. Now, I like Jack quite a bit. He embodies a certain archetype of the protagonist who struggles with their duty as the hero of the story, and that's something I like quite a lot. I wouldn't necessarily say that he's a reluctant hero, but he definitely has issues dealing with always doing the right thing and being the good guy, which we saw a lot of in the season 3 finale. And this flash forward basically sees him struggling with this normal life that he finds himself living with Kate and Aaron, and we see him start to fall down a self-destructive path as he questions his ability to become a good father, and he starts drinking and suspects that Kate might be cheating on him. He's basically becoming his father, and he even starts to see visions of his father. It's not a bad storyline, I actually kind of like its more psychologically focused character study style, but I question its thematic relevance. I'm not really sure what this flash forward is trying to tell us and why it comes at this point in the story. Is it just about showing us that Jack isn't good at living a normal life and becomes unstable if he's not playing the role of the hero on the island? Or are we seeing this episode just so we can bridge the gap between the Jack we saw in Kate's trial episode where he looks healthy and good, and the Jack we saw at the end of season 3 where he looks all disheveled and suicidal? But the real issue with this flash forward is that it finds itself placed in an episode where Jack on the island gets appendicitis which is a season 3 storyline if I've ever seen one. It's basically a filler episode and does nothing other than confirm once more that Jack is in love with Kate. This season does still have a few flashback episodes, one to introduce our new characters, which is good because it gives us a reason to actually care about these new people beyond just the superficial air of mystery like 
ooh, I wonder what they're really up to. But the show knows not to spend too much time on these new backstories, so they fit them all into one episode. Again, this is just another sign of the show's newfound conciseness. Is conciseness a word? Their desire to streamline the more plodding aspects of the story. And we also get another flashback episode for Juliet. And this one, on the other hand, is a tad more reminiscent of some season 3 flashbacks. It does seem somewhat irrelevant, and it does slow down the pacing a little, especially as it comes right after one of the best episodes in the entire show, which I'll get to in a minute. A story about Goodwin cheating on his wife with Juliet and Ben being jealous about it isn't exactly up to par with some of the other storylines in this season. And the other problem is that we didn't really need this to develop the animosity between Ben and Juliet. It's already been established in previous plotlines. Adding this romantic element to it just gives me season 3 flashbacks and I don't like it. We also get a flashback episode for Michael. Now, we haven't seen Michael since season 2 where, you know, he killed Anna Lucia and Libby and finally escaped the island with Walt. Unfortunately, Michael is one of a long list of characters that the writers don't really know what to do with anymore, and this is because Michael is a fairly one-note character. He can't really be given anything to do other than something revolving around his desire to protect his son. That's all his character has, and that arc can only realistically last for so long. He spent the entire first season trying to better his relationship with Walt, and it was pretty good, I liked Michael's episodes, but what can you do after that? They either get along or they don't. So the writers decided to have the others kidnap Walt. Okay, that's good enough. Now you can spend the second season having Michael desperately trying to get his son back. That's something for him to do. But how long can you drag that out for? It's no mystery why Michael isn't really in much of season two. His quest to find his son is obviously going to be his main priority. He's not just going to be lounging around the beach while everyone else does their own thing and just pop up once in a while to say, hey guys, can we go look for my son now? No, he's going to be out looking for him. But you can't really drag out a guy looking for his son on an island for an entire season, so you just have to send him away and forget about him for a while. And then of course you have him kill two people so that he can be reunited with his son and finally get off the island. And it's actually a pretty interesting direction to take his character in, because now it's not just about a guy trying to save his son, it's a storyline about morality and the lengths to which he's willing to go to save him, which is a pretty interesting story in my opinion. Unfortunately, they can't really keep Walt in the show because the actor was growing too fast, so they had to write around that, so that's probably why we end up with Michael's season 4 storyline. This easily could have been a failed story, just bringing back Michael out of nowhere to give him a little redemption arc so that the writers can write him out of the show in good conscience could have been a bit underwhelming and unnecessary. Why not just let him live a happy ending where he and Walt get off the island and we never have to hear from them again? Well, because Michael doesn't get a happy ending. Because Michael's story is a tragedy. He doesn't get to live happily ever after with Walt. Like I said in part one, at times it feels like the show is just beating up on Michael, like makes him really desperate, pushes him to do something really bad, and then punishes him for doing it. And that can seem really unfair. And that's because it is unfair. It's supposed to be. Narratively speaking, there has to be consequences for Michael making an immoral decision, or else it would nullify the importance of having to make that decision in the first place. And we see that the island won't even let him kill himself. They're not letting him get away that easy. The island forces him to redeem himself before he dies. Michael was allowed to save Walt from the island, but the price to pay for that was that he wouldn't be able to have his happy ending with his son. Okay, there is one more flashback episode, and that is Locke's. Now, this one's special because it retraces his entire life. From his birth, to his troubled times in high school, to his physical rehab after his dad pushed him out of a window, classic John, and in each of these periods we see the influence of what we'll call island people. <laughs> that sounds a bit offensive. First we have the mysterious guy Richard, who shows up at the hospital where John's born, and then a few years later he comes to see him again on behalf of a school for special children or something like that, where he has John do a strange test. 
and later Locke runs into a guy who tells him that he should go on a walkabout in Australia, which obviously leads him to the island in the end. So here we see the show kind of rewriting history and telling us that all of this was predetermined or manipulated. And I could see some people getting annoyed at this because it kind of minimalizes our protagonist's own free will and makes the feeling that all of this was meant to happen maybe a bit too explicit, but to be honest, I'm okay with this because fate has always been a prominent theme in the show and the idea that John was chosen and that he's special is obviously the central theme of his story. That and the idea of him overcoming his limitations and becoming something more. And here on the island, that something more is being the leader of the others. Beyond the flashbacks and flash forwards, this season also features a continuation of Desmond's flash back and forths as he jumps around in time. And of course, this gives us what is generally considered to be one of, if not the best episode of the entire show, season 4, episode 5, The Constant. And to be honest, there isn't really that much to say about this episode. It's just a really solid individual episode of television. Perfect narrative construction, there's never a second to rest, perfect thematic throughline intertwining both sci-fi and the emotional arc. It's all just really good, and it builds to probably the most emotionally satisfying scene in the entire show. Okay, now let's get into the season 4 finale, which is in three parts. The flash-forwards of which reveal what happened to the six characters who got off the island pretty much immediately after they were rescued. We see them doing a press conference, and then each returning and readjusting to their normal lives. And the storyline we get on the island in these last episodes is very much a everything's going wrong and no one's where they need to be kind of plot, as the mercenaries from the boat come back to get Ben and kill off everyone else in the meantime. Unfortunately, a big portion of the tension here is diminished from the fact that we already know that these six characters will survive and get off the island safely, so whenever they find themselves in tricky situations, the suspense isn't particularly effective. That being said, the suspense is pretty effective for everyone else, and the mystery of why the people who didn't get off the island didn't get off the island is compelling enough to keep you on the edge of your seat for this entire finale. And they do a good job of balancing the plot-driven excitement of what's happening on the island with the more subdued, character-driven stories of those who get off the island in the flash-forwards. All of which builds to a classic season finale where the suspense blends seamlessly with that typical lost brand of melancholy. And while these episodes do a great job of making us ask the question, how the hell are these six characters who are scattered across the island going to end up being the only ones saved, and competently balance and pace out the different, what I'll call, quests that each group of characters go on, I will say that this finale is somewhat lacking in interesting thematic progression. They do bring up the old philosophical conflict between Jack and Locke again in this scene where John asks Jack to reconsider his decision to leave the island, explaining that the island is special, it's a place of miracles, and Jack is like, there's no such thing as miracles, and while I have always liked the Jack and Locke divide, and I understand that the point here is that Locke is introducing to Jack the seed of the idea that the island is the place where he's supposed to be, which will then launch his arc once he's off the island of slowly realizing he wants to go back, I just don't think it's believable for Jack to deny the magic qualities of the island at this point. I will say that the only particularly interesting moment to me was Ben's passing of the torch to Locke. After going to see Jacob in the cabin again to find out what to do next, Locke is told that he has to move the island in order to save it. And it turns out the person who moves the island using this giant mechanism can never come back. So Ben decides to give up his position as leader, accepting that he's not the chosen one anymore, and takes on the burden of turning the wheel himself, leaving John to rejoin Richard and the others and become their new leader. I like this because it closes off an arc that's been gradually progressing since season 3, that arc being the conflict between Ben and Locke over who will be the leader and who will be seen as important in the eyes of the island. And both of these characters have very similar struggles with their purpose on the island, but for Locke it feels more like a test of faith, as if important things await him in the future. Whereas for Ben, it's more like he's already served his purpose, and he's about to be replaced. 
So him making this decision himself is a really powerful moment for his character. And him crying as he turns the wheel, giving up the one thing that his entire life has been centered on, the one thing that gave his life purpose, the island, is a pretty powerful moment. And the season ends with Desmond finally being reunited with Penny, even telling her that he'll never leave her again. Oh good, looks like Desmond's arc is over, I hope he doesn't get arbitrarily forced back into the story somehow, because that would, you know, kinda ruin this perfect conclusion to one of the best character arcs in the entire show. Oh boy. But anyway, the big season 4 cliffhanger is the reveal that Locke is actually dead, and apparently he left the island at some point to go tell Jack that they all need to come back because things have gone to shit since they left. Okay, now let's jump straight into season 5. So, on my big rewatch of the show, I was actually most excited about getting to seasons 5 and 6, which were the ones I had the least recollections of because I'd never actually gone back and rewatched them before. And I was desperate to see if this was the point where the show famously went downhill. And I have to be honest, I think season 5 is the season I had the most problems with so far. Continuing with the time travel element of the show, the gimmick for season 5 is that the island keeps jumping around in time, which is seemingly caused by Ben turning that wheel and moving the island at the end of season 4. Now, I don't think this is an inherently bad plot development, but I do think that choosing to stick with the whole time travel concept is pretty risky. The reason being that, well, time travel has been done a million times before, and using it as a major plot device for an entire season is probably only going to lead to one outcome. The show rewriting its own history, revealing that our characters were actually witness to, or the cause of, a number of important plot points in the story. Which... I personally don't find to be a particularly interesting use of time travel in fiction, because that's how time travel is practically always used. And this could be especially disappointing seeing as the show has used time travel in more interesting ways before, with Desmond's episodes, for example, and also that whole time difference between the island and the freighter in the previous season, which was never really expounded upon, unfortunately. Of course, they do try to spice things up a little by having the characters jump around in time, so it's not just that they've gone back in time, they're actually disconnected. Which could be a fun twist on the concept that makes it a bit more exciting and original, or it could be a repetitive and tiring gimmick that gets old real fast. And after rewatching this season, I'd say my opinion lands closer to the latter. I remember feeling the same way the first time I watched the show years ago. It felt somewhat frustrating, almost as if the show was stalling. The idea of having these characters jump around in time seems like an easy way of constantly putting them into situations and then arbitrarily pulling them out of those situations. That being said, I do appreciate the return to a somewhat simpler kind of mystery. As the story is paced out here, we can focus on this specific narrative device and use that to elaborate a larger mystery by slowly building up clues, presenting fragments of the mystery as we jump around in time, and reducing the number of character groupings we follow. I like the idea of restricting the focus to one group of characters on the island, who gradually have to piece together a larger mystery, their only clues being the specific slice of time they're exposed to after each jump. There's a certain level of clarity here that we didn't necessarily get in previous seasons. Right from the beginning, there's a clear circumstance, characters unstuck in time, and a clear goal, figure out how to not be unstuck in time anymore. It's an interesting way to tell a mystery story, while also being a good excuse to reveal some of the history of the island and give us some much-needed lore. And in the early episodes, I appreciate the character writing too. I like the Daniel and Sawyer pairing, they play off of each other really well, having completely opposite personalities, and Juliet is always there to be the voice of reason, while Miles throws out sarcastic quips in the background. It's a good mix, and it gives more screen time to our newer characters, which 
fleshes them out a bit more. Daniel especially shines here as he manages to be such a likable character while also giving off that underlying feeling of duplicity at the same time. Like he's always hiding something, but you get the impression that he probably has a good reason for hiding it. But what I don't like is that they immediately drag my boy Desmond back into the story, and I especially dislike the way they do it. So as Daniel and the others are jumping around in time, they arrive at a point in time where Desmond is still in the hatch by himself. And Daniel somehow knows that Desmond is the guy in the hatch, so he tells him to go find his mother once he gets off the island. Then we get a scene of Desmond waking up from a dream, in the present, off the island, where he remembers this happening. And this raises so many questions. First of all, an important aspect of Desmond's story is that he basically went insane in the hatch, waiting for his replacement to show up all by himself. So I think that if a random guy showed up one day and then disappeared into thin air after saying some weird shit, you'd probably remember that and... I don't know, maybe talk about it to the other people you meet later on at some point? And okay, let's say it's believable that he wouldn't talk to anyone about this extremely strange occurrence. What's not believable is that he would have forgotten this experience and then remembered it in a dream just at the right moment? Of course, you can find justifications for all of this. He probably forgot about it because he was going a bit crazy and maybe thought he hallucinated the whole thing or something, and perhaps he dreamt about it at that specific moment because the island made him dream about it. But if that's the case, it all just feels really contrived and unnecessary. Of course, they're doing the whole time travel thing, so it makes sense that they would want to play around with and do something like this, but if you're going to have the character just dream the memory, then what's even the point of it being a memory? He didn't even remember it by himself. The plot just made him remember it when it was the right time for him to remember it. You might as well just have him arbitrarily have a vision telling him what he's supposed to do next for the plot to move forward. And they even bring this up by having Penny ask Desmond why he only just remembered this, and they just brush it off. Desmond's like, I don't know, but I'm sure it definitely did happen. Oh, okay then. <sighs> and this storyline really does just ruin Desmond's arc in a way. And the way they present it, it's almost like they're making fun of the fact that they're ruining it. Before going to find Daniel's mother, Desmond tells Penny that this will be the last thing he does, relating to the island. Then they can go back to their lives, and everything will be just fine. And she's like, well, okay, as long as you never go back to that island. And Desmond's over here like, why would I ever want to go back there? I fucking hate this, because Desmond's whole story was about seemingly going against fate and overcoming his deeper issues in order to be reunited with his true love. That happened in the last season, and he explicitly said he would never leave her again. Now, not to jump the gun here, but we all know that Desmond is gonna go back to the island, so what the fuck? I don't know, maybe Desmond was just a fan favourite, so they wanted to keep him in the show, which is understandable, I guess, but you can't just throw him back into the story willy-nilly. If you're going to nullify his entire arc, at least attempt to introduce a new one that justifies why he would do this. Because as it is, it's almost like he's returning to the kind of behaviour that made him split up with Penny in the first place. But in the end, she accepts to go look for Daniel's mother with Desmond, so... It's okay, I guess. He's not leaving her behind again, but he's still being forced back into the plot with no significant thematic reason to be there. Okay, we're gonna have to speed run the rest of this because I'm starting to lose my voice a bit. <laughs> this episode also explores some of Daniel's backstory and the fact that a woman he subjected to some kind of experiment basically lost her mind. I'm not really sure what this means for Daniel's character, and it doesn't really go anywhere, but the writers seem to be creating a parallel with what's happening on the island with Charlotte, who's getting fucked up by the time jumps. Charlotte being one of the other people on the freighter who came along with Daniel and Miles and all that, um, if you didn't know. I don't think I've mentioned Charlotte yet. And Charlotte's character arc isn't really an arc, she was always the weakest of the freighter crew, especially since her and Miles' stories are kind of similar. 
she's looking for her birthplace and he's looking for his father who is on the island which is also where he was born but whereas charlotte's story never really amounts to anything just simply being an extra dimension that was tacked onto her character so that she at least had something going on miles actually has a somewhat touching episode where he gets to meet his father during one of the time jumps we also keep going with the flash forwards of course where we see jack and ben getting everyone together again in order to return to the island of course narratively speaking this is no easy task because you have to make it believable that these characters would actually want to return to the crazy magic island and they do mix things up a little with our characters off the island. Instead of having each episode focus on a single character, we get a bit of everyone in each episode, which is probably a good choice because at this point we just need to get these characters back on the island and don't really have that much interesting thematic beats to get through. It's mostly just about advancing the plot. They do sometimes attempt to give the characters some kind of arc though, and it doesn't always work. And this is going to be one of my main criticisms of season 5, I think. For example, episode 2 opens with the characters on Penny's boat, just after being rescued. They're discussing what they're going to tell the public, basically. And Hurley is the only one who is against lying and thinks it would be better to just tell the truth straight away. Obviously the others just say that no one would believe him, and for some reason he looks to Saeed and is like, they will if someone backs me up, <laughs> and Saeed is like, yeah, no, I think it's probably better to just lie, dude, and Hurley gets really mean for no reason. Why is he aiming this solely at Saeed? No one else wanted to back him up either. It feels really contrived, because obviously the only reason he says this to Saeed specifically is because in this episode he's going to be helping him. So they awkwardly introduce this idea that Hurley doesn't like lying and try to make that a sort of overarching theme for his story in this episode. And they really try to hammer this home as well, with Hurley repeatedly having to withhold the truth from his parents until he eventually reveals everything to his mother. And it is a pretty funny scene because obviously as he explains the plot he just sounds really crazy, but in the end it ends on a nice emotional note because despite the craziness of what he's saying his mother still believes him but this isn't really thematically important in any way an aversion to lying has never been an integral part of Hurley's character right I mean beyond the fact that he's generally just a nice honest guy I guess and it's never really made clear why he's so against it, especially seeing as they have perfectly good reasons for wanting to lie about what happened on the island. But he just keeps saying that they shouldn't lie, in a desperate attempt to give Hurley some kind of internal struggle. But it never really amounts to anything, because it's just an arbitrary struggle that doesn't really mean anything for Hurley's character. It's an artificially constructed reason for Hurley to want to return to the island, and Ben uses this aversion to lying against him, telling him that if he goes back to the island, he won't have to worry about all the lies and deceit anymore. And this is the moment where I went, oh, okay, now I see why they just randomly introduced this character trait. But then, no. Hurley says no to Ben because he doesn't trust him, and then he hands himself over to the police instead. So what was the point of this arc if it didn't even matter in the end? Given the setup, it actually would have made sense for Hurley to want to return to the island for this reason. So what's the point of subverting that ride at the end? That whole arc was basically just a waste of time. And it's funny how they do a sort of similar thing with Kate two episodes later. Just like with the Hurley episode, they start with a flashback on Penny's boat. And it's just Kate and Jack talking at night. Kate proposes that they lie and say that Aaron is actually hers. And she gives an explanation for why she would do this, saying that she's lost so many people, she doesn't want to lose him too. And to be completely honest, up until this point, I had never really questioned their decision to pretend Aaron was Kate's baby. I just saw it as part of the lie. But now that they try to explain it with this scene, I find myself questioning the decision. It doesn't really make sense, does it? And I think that the writers realized that and felt the need to include this scene that, just like with Hurley's aversion to lying, implants this character trait of Kate being attached to Aaron as if that's always been a part of her character 
or as if she shared some kind of bond with him, which just seems really dumb and inconsistent considering the kind of person Kate is. My theory is that they wanted the twist of Kate having Aaron, but didn't really know how to justify that. Because if you actually think about it for a minute, they wouldn't have to lie about Aaron's origins. They could just say that Claire was with them on the island, gave birth to Aaron, and then died at some point. But they, but they wanted to keep Aaron with Kate, so they had to find a reason why Kate would want to keep this baby. And I don't want to lose anyone else is the best they could come up with, I guess. And later on in this episode, back on the island, Sawyer and the others jump back in time, and Sawyer witnesses Claire giving birth with Kate, and I think they just included this scene to, again, try to convince us that Kate and Aaron have a bond, we swear, guys, they really do. See, she even delivered him, you know? <laughs> but really, it's too late now. This is something they should have been developing over the course of the show, giving us little moments where Kate takes care of Aaron or becomes a closer friend to Claire. We're five seasons into the show, goddammit. There's been plenty of time to build these little character arcs. But of course, for that to happen, you have to have these things planned out from the beginning. And, I don't know, maybe some of these criticisms come off as a bit nitpicky, but these are examples of a recurring pattern that I see emerging in Season 5, which is, make things happen, think up the explanations later. I think the writers hope that by the time they justify a plot point that occurred five episodes ago, you won't really care if it makes that much sense. And here's another instance of a similar problem. So we know that at some point, Locke leaves the island and tries to convince the others to return, and then dies. When we're presented with that information at the end of Season 4, we're left with a few questions. How did Locke leave the island? How did he die? And why did he want the others to return to the island? Locke tells Jack that the others are in danger, and it's because they left the island. But why does he think that? Why does Locke think that whatever bad thing that's going on in the island was caused by Jack and the others leaving. That is what's important to me here, because the answer to that question informs the character motivation, and iffy justifications of character motivations is the issue with the previous storylines I just described. You expect that as you advance in the story, Locke will be given a good reason to believe that he needs the others to return to the island in order to stop what's happening, but he's never given a good reason to believe that. He just theorizes that it's probably the case. Given the circumstances, why wouldn't you think that the time jumping phenomena is just some kind of byproduct of Ben turning the wheel and moving the island? It doesn't seem reasonable to assume that the cause was Jack and the others leaving the island. If I find myself dislodged in time, I would probably assume that has something to do with the thing that dislodged the island from space as well. Why not just give Locke a more significant reason to believe he has to get the others to come back? Maybe give him a vision of some sort, or have Jacob tell him, I don't know, something like that. At the end of the day, all this is, is plot twists at the expense of believable character motivations. It's like they're putting their cart before the horse. You can't just throw cliffhangers at the audience and then scramble to come up with an explanation later on. Or maybe they did plan it out ahead, and in that case, it's even worse, because it means they couldn't come up with a better justification for these plot points, despite having plenty of time to do so. <sighs> Damn, I'm starting to sound like the people who... <laughs> Say Lost went downhill, aren't I? Well, here we are. That being said, there are things that I do like about this season. For example, I love the opening scene of episode 6, where the others finally return to the island. We see Jack waking up in the jungle, and first of all, it obviously mirrors the opening scene of the show, when he first woke up on the island, but I also like that we can almost feel a certain sense of excitement, even though he's not explicitly expressing it. It's like he's got a little glint in his eye at the idea of being on the island again, and we see why immediately after. Just like in the first episode where he had to save people in the plane crash, here he has to save Hurley from drowning. This is what Jack does, this is what he's all about. This is what he wants and what he gets from the island. He gets to be the hero. He gets to save people and feel like it matters. And this is the scene that opens the episode, but this is actually a flash forward because the rest of the episode details the 36 hours leading up to these characters returning to the island. Jack, Ben, Sun, and Desmond all go to see Daniel's mother. 
Jack, Ben, and Son want to go back to the island, and Desmond just wants to deliver Daniel's message, and when she tells him that the island isn't done with him, he's like, oh yeah, bitch, <laughs> well, I'm done with the island, and just walks away. Because remember, Desmond has completed his character arc. He has Penny. He doesn't need to run away anymore, right? You're definitely not gonna find another excuse to force him back into the story again later on, right? Ah, god damn it, lost. But anyway, this is where things get stupid. <laughs> Daniel's mother tells Jack that they need to recreate the circumstances of the original flight as best as they can. And on the original flight, Jack was transporting his dead father, so they're going to use Locke's dead body as a substitute for that, but Jack needs to give something of his father's to Locke because, um, it seems so strange to me that your idea of recreating the original circumstances of the first plane crash would involve substituting one dead body for a completely unrelated dead body, but placing shoes that belong to the other one onto it? To do what? Trick the universe? <laughs> but of course the point of this is that in this scene they really try to push the theme they're playing with, which is the idea that Jack needs to have faith in this crazy nonsense in order to return to the island. Because remember in the previous season when Locke was telling Jack that he needed to have faith. Well, this is the continuation of that thematic thread. Which I'm all for. Like I said earlier, I enjoy the ideological battle between John and Locke. And I like the idea of having Jack go through this arc thanks to Locke's sacrifice. But why does it have to be something so contrived and random? So, anyway, in episode 7, after Jack and the others return to the island, we finally get to see Locke's story and why he ended up killing himself. But we start the episode off in an interesting place, on the island with the other survivors from this second plane crash. Our two main characters in this group are Caesar and Elana, who come across a now-living Locke, we then jump back into the past to see what happened to Locke directly after he turned the wheel. And I think I appreciate this structure because we're not wasting any time. There have been enough hints and Jesus parallels at this point that we all know Locke will be brought back to life somehow on the island. So the writers decide to get that reveal out of the way right off the bat. We can assume that the question of how he was revived won't be answered in this episode, so we can now focus on the central mystery of the flashback, which is, why did Locke kill himself? And this episode is really good, probably one of my favourites of the entire show, because it's a simple, contained story about Locke going around the world, trying to convince the others to return to the island with him. It's focused and minimal, yet it contains a fair amount of emotional depth, because what this episode is really about is Locke figuring out why he himself wants to go back to the island. It's like a retrospective of Locke's entire character, and a particularly poignant moment is when Locke asks Matthew, a guy who works for Whitmore and who has been driving him around to all these locations, to look up Helen, who we remember from Locke's flashbacks back in season one, his girlfriend, the woman he eventually drove away because of his obsession with his father. Well, it turns out that she died of a brain aneurysm, and this forces Locke to reflect on his past mistakes, especially when Kate points out to him the similarity between his obsession with his father, and how that ruined his relationship with this woman, and his obsession with the island, which, I mentioned back in part one, the two are innately connected, Locke's desire to derive meaning in his life from his newfound relationship with his father, and then his relationship with the island. And this is where Locke begins to question himself and his role in all of this, and this is reinforced in his scene with Jack, which I particularly like. Jack really hammers it home, and this scene once again plays into that ever-present ideological divide between the two, about faith and logic, reason. Locke's story has always been about faith, faith in the island, faith in his own ability, faith in the idea that he and the others are special. And here he takes one last leap of faith with his suicide. He has faith that his death will somehow get the others to realize the truth. The truth being that they're all special, and that they all play a role in this story. 
because Jack may be right. Locke is a sad, lonely old man, but he's also right to have faith. He's also right in believing that he's special. Basically, it's the perfect ending for Locke's story. Is what I would say if Ben didn't walk in on Locke during the suicide attempt, convince him to get down, and then murder him in cold blood. Now, <laughs> Jesus Christ, this doesn't nullify any of the previous stuff I just described, but I do have to question why exactly the writers felt the need to turn what would have been an incredibly satisfying emotional climax to Locke's entire character arc into a cheap, pulpy twist. It just doesn't make sense. I guess maybe they didn't want to have, you know, an emotional moment of a character committing suicide and that act being proven right in the end because it does convince the other characters to go back to the island. But why is murdering him any better than that? <laughs> ah, they always do this, man. Why do they have to do this? The direction Sawyer's character takes in this season is fairly interesting, because at this point he's more than redeemed himself for what he was at the beginning of the show, going from being a smart-mouthed asshole to devolving into a hot-headed, likeable guy. But for the past few seasons, his arc has just kind of been on standby. So here the writers decide to actually do something with his character. He basically becomes the new leader for our characters who got left on the island. And so a conflict is formed between Sawyer and Jack when the others return. But whereas Jack's opposition to someone like Locke was more ideological and thematic, his conflict with Sawyer is more so rooted in this bizarre romantic rivalry they've got going on because Sawyer is now dating Juliet, and of course, Jack and Kate have their thing, which definitely makes it seem a lot more petty and soapy and melodramatic. But this new position for Sawyer's character does at least showcase his evolution. He's now a pragmatic leader who protects his people. He's become more wise and selfless. And the next episode is a Said episode. And this one episodes... And this one opens... This, this one episodes... Jesus Christ... And this one opens with a flashback from Saeed's childhood, where a man asks his son to kill a chicken, and then Saeed walks up to him because the boy doesn't want to do it, and he's like, I'll do it for you, and he kills the chicken instead. Which, by the way, is really reminiscent of Mr. Echo's flashback in uh, season two, where, where his brother is told to kill someone, but he doesn't want to do it, and Mr. Echo is like, you know, trying to protect his brother, so he kills the guy instead. And how many times in this show are we going to hammer home the point that Saeed does bad things and that he's a morally grey character? I appreciate the thematic focus that Lost brings to its characters, but there's a difference between focus and redundancy. How many times can we do the whole, oh, is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? I don't know, he's done some bad shit in the past, but has he redeemed himself? before it gets old and we realise that we're not really making any progress with Saeed's character. His flashbacks in this episode detail him finishing his work with Ben off the island, because he's been working as like a, a hitman, an assassin for Ben. So he kills the last guy on the list, and then he moves away to South America, where Ben finds him again and asks him to do one more killing for him. And he has to choose whether or not he's going to go back to his old ways again. And in the present, Saeed comes to the realization that his purpose here on the island is to die. He basically thinks this is his punishment for his crimes. So when Sawyer tries to help him escape, he says no. But then it turns out he was just lying to Sawyer and instead escapes with the help of a 12 year old Ben Linus. Um, because this is all happening in the past, of course. And he does this so that he can kill the child Ben. It's a bit of a would-you-kill-a-baby-Hitler type situation. Now, of course, this plot point brings us to the elephant in the room, which is time travel. Depending on what kind of time travel system we're adhering to here, the fact that Ben is alive in the future means that it's impossible for him to die here, which is exactly the position the show seems to be taking. 
However, some doubt is thrown into the mix, which forces the characters to reconsider their situation. Maybe they can change the past. Maybe this is a different kind of time travel, where going back to the past creates a new timeline. But of course, the important thing here isn't the specific mechanics of time travel in this show, it's how the characters react to it. Because the doubt over whether or not they can actually change the past is a very strong narrative device. In this following episode, for example, we see Kate trying to convince Jack to go help them save the young Ben, but Jack's like, nah, I'm good, I've already saved him once before, and I'm not going to do it again. That's not my purpose here. And he kind of refers to the fact that Miles has explained to them that they can't change the past as an excuse for not doing it. Because whether he helps or not, it won't change a thing, right? Because we know Ben isn't dead in the future. If this was the system the show was sticking to, this would kind of ruin a lot of character agency. But because the seed of doubt is thrown in there, we're now in a situation where our characters are unsure of what their role is and how much impact they're actually having on this timeline. Which is thematically relevant, of course, because this entire debate feeds into Lost's central theme of fate and purpose. So it's a good way of using the time travel gimmick as a means to explore these themes and character arcs, where the focus isn't really on the sci-fi mechanics of it all, but on the characters. And it's in the last few episodes that we really understand the thematic importance of the use of time travel and how it relates specifically to Jack's character arc. He feels that his purpose now is to make it so none of this ever happened. He now actually thinks that he can change the future so that the plane never crashes, thus erasing all the tragedy and misery that all of these characters have been through since the start of the show. Kate responds to this saying, it wasn't all bad. So here we have a thematic conflict that arises. Is erasing all of this pain and suffering a good thing if it comes at the expense of the growth that these characters have experienced on the island? That's the question being explored here. This builds to a confrontation between Jack and Sawyer, Kate and Juliet, who are all trying to stop him. Jack and Sawyer have a little sit down to get to the bottom of what Jack really wants, and it turns out that it's all about Kate. Yep, the reason he wants to set all this straight is because he had his chance with Kate and he fucked it up, and he really regrets that. And this is one of my least favorite character moments in the entire show, probably, for multiple reasons. First of all, as Sawyer immediately points out, if Jack's plan to blow up the electromagnetic force on the island works, and their plane never crashes in the future, then Jack and Kate will never meet. And Jack's like, what's meant to be is meant to be. What the fuck does this even mean, man? Why are the writers trying to connect Jack's feelings for Kate to his plan to change the future when it obviously doesn't add up? If, at this point, Jack's character is driven by something as uninteresting as his feelings for Kate, then shouldn't he be on the opposing side of this conflict? Shouldn't he be the one trying to stop whoever from blowing the island up to change the future, because this would result in him and Kate never meeting? Wouldn't he instead be thinking, well, I fucked up my relationship with Kate when we were off the island, but who knows, maybe I'll get a second chance. Maybe we can make it work if we try again. But if we never meet, then that won't happen. So I need to stop whoever's trying to blow this bomb up and change the future. The narrative beats just don't follow from one another. It's not well thought out. The question that's posed to Jack in this scene is really simple. Why are you so intent on changing the future so that none of this ever happens? His answer is, because I love Kate and I fucked it up. How is this answer related to that question? It doesn't follow, and the writers are obviously aware of this because they have Sawyer pointed out, but Jack just deflects it with a line that is completely contrary to his goal. If what's meant to be is meant to be, then why are you trying to change what happened? Shouldn't the person saying what's meant to be is meant to be be the one trying to stop whoever's going to change the future? Because the plane crashed, it all happened, there's nothing you can do about it, right? What's meant to be is meant to be. <sighs> Jesus Christ, man. And the reason this is so disappointing and confusing for me is that there's an obvious other explanation for why Jack is doing what he's doing that would make complete sense thematically. 
It's the fact that Jack desperately wants to feel needed. He wants to feel that sense of being special and having a purpose. He wants to be the hero who saves the day. Why make it about dumb relationship drama? The relationship with Kate didn't work out because Jack self-destructs when his life is going well, when everything's normal and things start to get a bit boring. He needs to be the hero of some great adventure, some great story. It's this deep-seated issue that drives Jack and Kate apart, and drives him back to the island. And it would follow naturally from this that Jack would cling on to this plan to blow up the island as his ultimate fate. He's desperate for a heroic destiny, and it would justify everything that went wrong in his relationship with Kate. It just wasn't meant to be. All he had to say in response to Sawyer's question was something like, I need this. This is what I'm supposed to do. This is what this has all been about. And then right after this, Juliet comes up to Sawyer and is like, oh, by the way, I've changed my mind, and I think we should blow up the island now. Jack's right, actually. And her explanation is that, well, she saw the way Sawyer looked at Kate and realized that he's still in love with her, and maybe that means that they're not meant to be together, so if they change the future and they never come to the island, maybe that'll be for the best. Because as she puts it, if I never meet you, then I'll never have to lose you. <sighs> Yep, doesn't really make sense either, especially considering the fact that Juliet would have seen the way Sawyer was looking at Kate way before this point, so why is she just changing her mind now, at this very pivotal point that's very convenient for the plot? And what's worse is that this somehow convinces Sawyer to change his mind too. What the hell is going on? This is a direct consequence of the relationship drama that started all the way back in season 3, and it's exactly why I knew it was a bad sign when that started happening back then. It muddles up everyone's character arcs and makes it so none of the character motivations make sense anymore. There are plenty of interesting arcs and themes to draw on here for character motivations, so why make it about relationship melodrama? Why make that the thing that's going to decide whether or not a character will choose to detonate a hydrogen bomb or not? Another big issue with this whole thing is, of course, that these characters still aren't really sure how this whole time travel thing works, and they definitely don't know why blowing up a bomb in this electromagnetic pocket will solve the problem. All Jack is going off are Daniel's ideas, the ideas of a man who was once convinced that they couldn't change the future because everything was set in stone, then disappeared for a while, then came back with this wacky plan, and then immediately died. And as always, Miles is the of reason and points this out to the group. Are they accidentally causing the very thing they're trying to avoid? But everyone literally just ignores him. It feels like the writers are bringing this up because they realize that it's something that they should be thinking about, but it's a concept that doesn't really fit into the other character's decision-making process because they're all driven by who they have a crush on at that particular moment in time. So everyone's like, Duh, what? I don't get it. <laughs> but of course, this is the most interesting idea in this entire plotline, and the one thing that's always stuck with me ever since I watched this season for the first time. Are they accidentally causing the very thing they're trying to avoid? It's an interesting question, and considering the fact that there's no way of knowing, is it better to just do nothing? What happens to human agency in this framework of uncertainty? These are the kinds of questions that a show like Lost should be exploring, not just ignoring in order to focus on relationship drama. Okay, moving on from all that, the finale finally introduces us to Jacob, and his rivalry with the Man in Black, the two opposing forces of the island. The flashbacks we get in these two episodes show us glimpses of Jacob intervening in the lives of some of the main characters, indicating that they've all been candidates from the beginning, candidates being the people Jacob chooses for potential replacements as protectors of the island. We see Jacob as the hand of fate, in a sense. He launches each of these characters down the path that will eventually lead them to the island. 
and having Ben be the one to kill Jacob does make sense for his character, and it builds to a way more satisfying climax than the other climax in this episode, the one with the bomb and all that, because this is a plotline that has all the elements. It has the mystery, that's perhaps a bit too much with the literal mystery box being carried around, it has the lore of Jacob and the Man in Black and their centuries-old feud, and it has an actual character arc that makes sense. So overall, I would say that season 4's new beginning for the story ended up being a double-edged sword. While it offered a much-needed renewal of interest in the advancement of the plot, by letting us know that we have an end goal in sight and that things were really going to start happening now, it also closed off a lot of character arcs and thus left season 5 with the tough task of piecing things together and coming up with believable reasons for characters off the island, some of which who had seemingly completed their stories, to return to the island. Which means jump-starting new character arcs, or at least building on previous ones, in a way that makes sense. Season 5 introduced a new and exciting approach to exploring the deeper, older mysteries of the island, which was very much a refreshing change of pace for the show, but which at times came at the expense of meaningful and engaging character writing, which has always been one of the most important and attractive elements of the story in previous seasons. Here the writers seem so distracted by the machinations of the plot and setting everything up so that we can get all of these moving parts to work in cohesion that they tend to overlook, somewhat understandably, themes and character. Which is unfortunate because in terms of plot, this is one of the tighter and better paced seasons of the show, in my opinion. In the end, I think season 5 is my least favourite season so far, because of the many character writing issues I pointed out, and despite the fresh and interesting plot ideas, the season is littered with annoying and or underwhelming side characters, questionable character motivations that sort of detract from the strong thematic throughline of fate and destiny, what could have been a great storyline about our beloved characters grappling with these big metaphysical ideas, like the hatch in season 2, instead devolves into the fate of the island resting on the whims of four characters caught up in a love rectangle. Okay, that's it for part 2. Join me in part 3, <laughs> hopefully sometime in the near future, where I will finally be tackling season 6 and the finale of Lost, and we will really, truly, finally get to the bottom of whether or not Lost went downhill. In the meantime, you know, consider supporting me on Patreon, <laughs> follow me on Twitter if you want. I'll see you next time.